welcome to Expedient Means at Lin Weiwei on Time Monk Radio. Lin currently resides in China and is a founder and head teacher of Guizhen Philocultural Society. His extensive experience in Buddhist and Taoist meditation, Qigong, martial arts, and traditional Chinese medicine. To learn more about Lin, please visit his website at www.guizhenhui.net. Tonight, Lin will be speaking about the Tao Te Ching chapters 21 through 30. Welcome back, Lin. Hello, hello. All right, so hopefully your uh, computer will keep up and, and keep functioning I, for the rest of the interview. I hope it does. Right. <laughs> I hope it does. It should be fine. I mean, uh, just, you know, having little technical issues, but it should be okay. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off here by uh, reading chapter 21. And, okay. Uh, we'll take it from there. So chapter 21, the appearance of great virtue follows only the Tao. The Tao is a thing, seems indistinct, seems unclear. So unclear, so indistinct, within it there is image. So indistinct, so unclear, within it there is substance. So deep, so profound, within it there is essence. Its essence is supremely real, within it there is faith. From ancient times to the present, its names never depart. To observe the source of all things, how do I know the nature of the source with this? Very cool stuff. Oh, also, I got to let everybody know we're in the middle of my office. Uh, we're in my office, and we're going to have a little, slight little background noise here and there. So just to interrupt our conversation, that's where we're going. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see here. He's speaking on cultivating virtue, true virtue, not acting virtuous in order to gain something to fulfill your desires. So he's going on to state that original nature he goes out. Uh, it's unclear and distinct, and then begins to go further in saying how it is one thing, but beholds everything else within it. So this is like the original nature, the thus nature of all living beings. You know, it's saying it beholds every single thing inside of it, but there is no bounds to it either. Uh, the last thing, you know, I really took the whole entire um, excerpt he had here, the whole entire chapter here, and I just squeezed it into just a few few words. But the last sentence is pretty interesting. He says, with this, you know, he means with a non-discriminating mind. It's because he went on to describe everything as it is and what it beholds within it. So with a non-attached mind, a mind of no discrimination, one can know without knowing. They can embrace without embracing, you know, so on and so forth within that context. <clears throat> so it's very right. short. <laughs> it's just very yeah. straight to, to the point. Yeah, there's not a lot of meat. Well, I mean, I, I say there's not a lot of meat. I mean, it, it's profound at the same time. But again, it's it's that simple, simple we, profundity. We can go very much into philosophizing every two sen every two sentences he has here. But really, if we're looking at the Tao Te Ching, let's say we're gonna look at it from a point of view, uh, from his point of view, from Lao Tzu's point of view, and though we can we can intellectualize you know you can false think a little bit about what his point of view could have been and we can say well he's writing this because he sees a mess in the world he sees some crazies going on out, uh, out in the world in his lifetime he's like you know people need this stuff uh, and they need a foundational basis for cultivation they need a foundational basis to just be good people so he throws this out there if we make it too intense too intellectual uh too philosophical who's really going to understand it the average guy in the street who sells hot dogs on the corner? Not to say that those people can't really understand it. I mean, they probably are f professors and whatnot, too, who are selling hot dogs and just feel like they want a more easier life. No, what, what I'm trying to teach me, teach me anything. You never know the guy in the corner selling hot dogs could be a Taoist immortal for all we know. Right? You know what I'm saying? But what I mean is just the person who really is not intellectually apt, who's not truly like – a study kind of person or a cultivator or even anyone who just uh, – what's the word? Who just doesn't even know anything about this stuff or has any, doesn't have any clue about this stuff. This is what I mean. We got to make it – he's trying to make it so simple. But the, well, the, uh, just the main simple person, person who just cuts grass or you know, uh, makes build, big, builds buildings or whatever, who just focuses on that kind of work, who doesn't do any kind of intellectual studies can get the idea. Well, that, that's sort of the beauty of the Tao Te Ching is you can read it and it, it'll work on so many different levels. I mean, you can mm -hmm. read it at a very superficial level, uh, philosophical level, uh, yeah. map, map to cultivation, you know, it, it really... And 
just to just to throw a little uh idea onto the type of commentary that we're doing here. Um, I'm doing this type of commentary because um, the manner of my commentary is really just cutting out every single thing else and getting straight to the core of your mind, the core of what we consider to be our being. It has nothing to do with the, excuse me, one is cultivating this yin energy or that yin energy or doing this type of breathing or recognizing this type of thing in a tree or, you know, all these other types of um, outlooks that we can find in other commentaries. I, I'm totally Xing that out. I'm not saying those things aren't, aren't needed. Those things are good use. Uh, they're useful too. All I'm saying is uh, the manners in which I'm talking on the Tao Te Ching here is straight through. Like if we're reading um, chapter 21 and going so unclear and so distinct, we're going, wow, so it's like very, uh, it's intangible. Uh, but then there's something in it. There's an image, and we may get attached to form, and we may get we may get attached to creation, creating things, and then destructing things, destruction of things. So we may get stuck in that kind of worldview. I'm totally dropping or cutting off the heads of all these types of views and saying, directly pointing to the original nature. I can see that in these teachings. That's just probably me. Maybe someone else may. Maybe someone else won't. But for those who can hear this type of a commentary. Uh, can hear it, meaning not just hear it with their ears, but I mean hear it, resonate with it on, on a specific mannerism. They can grasp what I'm saying. And for those who are just new to it or just trying to get a, an idea of what's going on with cultivation world, they pick up the Tao Te Ching and somehow come across our commentaries, it's not going to be that uh, difficult to understand. It's straight to the point, at least. I tried okay. to make it. So just to give everyone a clue, they're going to go, oh, this sounds like you're just always talking about cutting through the, to the original nature, cutting through the false thinking. This is very Chan. And this is very Buddhist. But this is very cultivation because if you're going to sit there doing your Zhen Zhuang or doing what you consider to be Taoist, I mean, you have turning exercises in the Sufi tradition. Okay, is that Taoist? But it can get them to high level states and high wisdom and uh, spiritual powers too. Oh, so how the hell is that not what we're doing with circle walking? Just another mannerism of applying circle walking. And doubt people who practice Taoism apply circle walking because they like the way it is according to their uh, energetic cultivation. So then people labeled it Taoist. <laughs> but really, a Muslim can practice it. <laughs> and it could be a Muslim walking practice too. So these things, we have to really chop out these names. That's why I, I go for the cut out these false thinking and just get to the point of cultivation. If you're sitting there with false thinking while you're meditating, you're not meditating. If you're doing standing practice and you're sitting there thinking, oh, I got this sensation in my shoulder. Oh, I feel this sensation in my right butt cheek. You know, you're not doing standing. You're just standing up, but you're not actually cultivating standing. So remember, your mind, everything has to be all on this one specific thing you're doing. We'll call that Chan. Oh, we'll call that single-minded concentration in your practice of uh, Qigong. That's the only way you can, one is going to get anywhere is if they cut out false thinking. That's why I always find that in the Tao Te Ching chapters, and I really press that issue. I could be repeating myself in many different commentary, uh, many different chapter commentaries, but um, there's many ways to, uh, <laughs> no offense to the animal rights activist, skin a cat. <laughs> as long as we don't eat it. <laughs> No comment on that one. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry on then. Do uh, chapter twenty-two. Well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go Yield ahead. and remain whole. Bend and remain straight. Be low and become filled. Be worn out and become renewed. Have little and receive. Have much and be confused. Therefore, the sages hold to the one as an example for the world, without flaunting themselves, and are so keen. And sorry, and are so are seen clearly without presuming themselves, and so are distinguished, without praising themselves, and so have merit, without boasting about themselves, and so are lasting. Because they do not contend, the world cannot contend with them. What the ancient calls the one who yields and remains whole, were they speaking empty words? Sincerity becomes whole and returning to oneself. <laughs> yeah, I love this because almost, yeah. almost um, I, I, from conversations I had with people since I'm a child, going through spiritual Expos, you know, and the people reading your auras, reading your cards, selling you crystals and screaming out how they're, they're touching up on the universal energies and sending out all this great unconditional love to everyone. This, this chapter, 22, <laughs> the way it's translated, just reminds me of all those people 
um, pushing to become the next guru. You know, it's like if they read this, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not not boasting. I am very much boasting. I am very much praising myself. <laughs> I'm very much flaunting myself. <laughs> you know, in the early 80s into the 90s, mid 90s, there was a lot of flaunting, a lot of self praise and boasting of people who had what they considered themselves to have was uh, spiritual powers. You know, they. They love to show off their, I can read your mind, I can read cards, I can read your future, I can read your palm, you know. And uh, everyone had this, well, not everyone, I'm sorry, but there were many who had their, their nose very, very high up, <laughs> sticking up really high. And uh, <laughs> I just wish they would have read this one chapter and they'll probably go, oh. <laughs> well, it's okay. not just the 80s, let me tell you, it's, it's still uh, quite uh, pertinent today. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, then we'll have uh, people practicing uh, Tai Chi Chan, practicing Ba Gua Zhang, Xing Yi, or whatever, and uh, Qi Gong, or whatever, saying, hey, I'm this such and such a Sifu. You know, I am a this a Sifu. I am a that Sifu. Uh, I, uh, I am a Taoist this, and I'm a Taoist that. But, <laughs> dude, <laughs> you don't wear it on your shoulder. <laughs> Read this chapter. If you're a Taoist, okay. If you're not a Taoist, okay. Read it anyway, <laughs> because we need a guideline in cultivation. If we didn't need any guideline whatsoever as a human being, and we think freedom is just to run around like a chicken without a head, Lao Tzu wouldn't have to be around. If that was just the way things need to be, that then not Lao Tzu would never come around. The Buddha would never come around. We wouldn't have other immortals and other teachers out there telling us to shut up, <laughs> get to practice, and be a good person. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, for from my perspective, when I see somebody who's wearing it on his sleeve, you know, it, it tends to make me shy away from that person. And right. from a Western perspective, you know, you see all these McDojos and you go in and the guy's wearing this fancy silk suit and he's, he looks the yeah. part. Um, usually to me, that's a good indication that he's probably um, doesn't walk the walk so much as talk the talk. Yeah. You know, I got that. I had that a lot because from when I was a young teen, probably around 18, 17, 18, I started wearing Chinese clothes. I didn't know that they were Chinese clothes. I mean, I knew that I saw a picture of an old Chinese guy fishing and he was wearing these clothes and I said, I want to be that. Another Chinese guy, but I want to be that, <laughs> that essence, you know, that mannerism. He just sat there content with life, totally at peace with himself. Despite his clothes being raggedy, he had enough to eat, he had his tool to get food, and he had a place to put his butt. And I said, that's beautiful. I want to emulate that. And it took a long time to get like that. Um, but when you do that, you get expedient means, which are you get the things that fit for that kind of feeling. You buy the clothes. You, you, you utilize that lifestyle as much as you can imagine it. And then it becomes your lifestyle. Then you integrate your own cultural ways and you integrate the way you are with society and whatnot. And what happens is it becomes your lifestyle. So for me, it was my lifestyle wearing the long Chinese robes, the old style Qing Dynasty robes, uh, the old style frog button shirt. People would make fun of me. I had no clue why until I was around like 21, 22. A friend of mine told me that these were old Chinese clothes, like old style. I said, no wonder people are making fun of me going, what the hell, everywhere I go, you know. <laughs> I still wore it because it, it became part of how I knew I wanted to live my life. That helped me sustain a specific mind state. Then when I didn't need those tools to sustain it anymore, I still continue wearing it because it was just comfortable. <laughs> I know, I know, when, I, you know? I know. when I first got into this stuff, I thought, you know, started looking at it and I thought, oh, chonk, Sam, that'd be cool to have one of those in a robe. And then I thought about it and I kind of thought about it and thought about it and turned <laughs> over my mind. And then I thought, do I just want that to look the part? And then I just, mm. to, to me, it just didn't seem like it, it fit with right. where my mind was, you know what I mean? I thought mm -hmm. maybe I was just adopting it for the wrong reasons. Uh, I adopted it because it was just comfortable for me. It fit when I, I could meditate and sit anywhere and cross my legs without having to fiddle with the jeans, you know, being too tight, cut off my circulation, and <laughs> get blue feet. <laughs> you know? I, I, should, yeah. I, do, I do have one frog button shirt, but it's just because it really looks cool and I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> but lo and behold, um, even moving out into China – uh, people made fun of me out here because they nobody wears these clothes anymore. And it has nothing to do with they don't want their culture. Each dynasty had their own specific style. 
So right now, the dynasty we have is the communist dynasty, <laughs> and they have their own style, which is the uh, foreign ideas of a t-shirt and jeans, which they consider to be more comfortable and more convenient. So what? Me, recently, I personally changed my, my um, dress style, and I wear casual clothes, jeans, t-shirts, casual suits, or whatnot. Reason? It takes the spotlight off of me. Now that I'm here in China, a little bit more... Uh, we say more stable out here. I apply Chapter 22 very, very, very much without even having to know of Chapter 22. Don't let people know what you're doing. Um, they see the robe and they think martial arts or they think Buddhist or they think Taoist. And I really don't want to be coined that because I wear the clothes. That was never my intention anyway. But I, since I see that's the conditions people live by, excuse me, I adjust myself for the conditions. So you accord with conditions. Now people don't even... Um, look twice at me in the street and I'm so excited because I can walk around peacefully <laughs> you know uh, I'm still teaching martial arts I'm still teaching the cultivation and I still do what I do and I still uh, surprise your shit out of people when they excuse my language which is true when they talk with me and they're like oh my god I, I would never think you would do these things I say that's the point you know so you don't want to do things that make you stand out and I realized that even I was personally at peace with what I was wearing and what I was doing it was causing too much attention, uh, more so now than it was maybe a month ago, because uh, I'm a little bit more out in the society now doing things. I, I would just say not so much that you don't want to wear things that make you stand out, but you don't want to stand out uh, for egoistic reasons. You know Exactly. I mean, I don't want to stand out because people will look at it, coin a specific mannerism on me, and then it's as though when I go out, that's the mask I'm wearing. Or, or it'll create false thinking in other people, right? Exactly. That That's a very, very important point. So I just chop it off. So here, chapter 22, we'll put it in three words, quoting Master Zheng Lanqing again. Invest in loss. How much you don't need. Okay? Like, we have a house, big, beautiful house, billions of rooms. We don't need all that. Probably need two rooms, you know? And uh, we're done. In our modern society, truly. If it was in a society where we didn't have to worry about how many rooms we have, a building, and all these types of luxuries or whatever, probably just one big piece of, you know, four walls and a ceiling, you know, and we can make do with that. And people lived like that for thousands of years. Now we're just living the way we do now, you know? Yeah, I think um, one one of our uh, our friends from the forum, I guess not friends, but the forums dedicated to him, Cliff High, uh, discussed um, Genghis Khan and, and how he refused to allow his people to uh, to build luxurious houses. He only allowed them to, to travel with, uh, you know, basically portable tents or what, what they call Mongolian earths. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's if you're a nomad, you know, running around from place to place, you don't need everything. And why be attached to sticking in one spot? I mean, if your area in one time of the year is extremely hot, then you would travel to a cooler climate for the next several months. You know, then when over there gets too cold, you would come back to the warmer climate for the next several months. So that would be more of according with nature. Or you cultivate your butt off so when it's hot outside, your body can regulate its temperature properly. And when it's cold outside, your body can regulate its temperature properly. But that takes a lot of work, and most people don't really want to apply themselves that way. So number 22 is saying uh, invest in loss, really checking out how much do you need, you know, really. And this is, we can put this to cultivation. We can put this to just relating with people or how we're going to live in society. Um, just one, one quick point, I guess, uh, in terms of cultivation. Again, it could go back to people, you know, wanting to, well, I guess, I guess it's kind of what you've already mentioned about flaunting their palm rating and stuff. But um, again, like, you know, you see so many people that are attached and chasing after the powers and stuff, right? So uh, I would kind of apply it to that as well. Yeah, I mean, we can take it back to what we said right in the beginning of the Chapter 22 com commentary on people calling themselves, uh, walking around like I'm this Sifu and I'm this and that master or whatever. You know, these are misinterpretations. We just quickly run to this word itself. Sifu has a two, is a Cantonese pronunciation. Shifu is the Mandarin pronunciation. And the, the character for Fu at the end has two different characters. One is a prof one with a professional skill or a skill that they are utilizing that brings them money. <laughs> okay, or gives a service to people. 
Okay, that one is a respectful. It, they call it a respectful title, but generally, people will just call one that. Uh, call someone who has a specific skill set. Okay, as a nice way of recognizing them. Okay, that's it. Anyone can be that. The other one is if let's say the, the other character is a fool, which was which is uh, for father. Now let's say the person who had this specific uh, special skill set, maybe he fixes watches, and let's say he has an apprentice. That apprentice serves him tea or does whatever tradition that there is for that kind of uh, situation. Now that that guy who has a professional a professional skill set becomes the, the apprentice's father teacher. Has nothing to do with master. He becomes a father teacher. He becomes a father figure basically to that person. That's all. It has nothing to do with the word master. But there's no reference to that in the English title where they're going to walk around in all the martial arts schools in the West and go, Father, father figure, how are you? You know? No. <laughs> so they'll probably say master, which that kind of that feels a little strange too in, in the West. So they call it it's evil. They stick with the same translation. But the idea is wrong. It has nothing to do with the word master. If you have a skill set in utilizing computers and doing things with computers and you're very, very good at it and someone wants to learn from you, Okay, and they're by your side all the time, and you really guide them through it, and they become your apprentice. And then you become you become their father figure, their teacher, their pseudo parent slash teacher. So we have a saying for that specific character. When you have the te teacher character and the father character, it's a teacher for a day, a father for life. That means no matter where you are or how you are, if that student ever wants to contact you ever again, the door is always open for them. And you're always willing to help them. And they are, should be always willing to try to help you. But if, you, if the person turns around and screws over their, their disciple or their apprentice, just leave. There's no need to stick around with evil things like that. Uh, so really, this chapter 22 is so important for anyone, whether you're a martial artist and you don't give craps about Taoism or cultivation, or you are a cultivator and you're like, well, I'm a cultivator, you know, I want to teach people and really get on my going here and get people to follow me and, and all that stuff. You read that, you can sit there and slap yourself in the face going, oh, I should never do that. <laughs> a big face palm. Oh, what, what did I do yesterday? Damn it. <laughs> all right. Well, let's, uh, let's move on let's, to chapter 20. Let's go on to chapter 23. Okay. Sparse speech is natural. Thus, strong wind does not last all morning. Sudden rain does not last all day. What makes this so? Heaven and earth. Even heaven and earth cannot make it last. How can humans? Thus, those who follow the Tao are with the Tao. Thus, those are, who follow virtue are with virtue. Thus, those who follow loss are with loss. Those who are with the Tao, the Tao is pleased to have them. Those who are with virtue, virtue is also pleased to have them. Those who are with loss, loss is also pleased to have them. Those who do not trust those who do not trust sufficiently, others have no trust in them. Ah, oh, this is so good. Inner wisdom brings non-discrimination. Ha ha ha. That's what it means. Straight up, I put all. How many is that? Three, six, da da. 12, 13 lines, 14 lines, 13 lines. Inner wisdom brings non-discrimination. <laughs> the more you cultivate, the more you wake up, the more you wake up, the more you realize what you've done, then you don't do those things anymore and you find yourself in line with all that is, which is our original self, our original nature, that which permeates all, permeates all directions. Uh, so he's going, those who... Uh, follow the Tao are with the Tao. Those who follow virtue are with virtue. Now, some people like to argue this sentence and say, Tao and virtue. So he put two separately. He doesn't mean Tao means virtue. He's just saying those who follow the Tao, follow the Tao. Those who follow virtue, follow virtue. They don't follow the Tao. Sorry. You can't have yeah, one without the other. Yeah, that would be a bad interpretation. <laughs> Exactly. They'll be like, oh, well, you know, they're two different paths. The Tao is just a Tao. But if you have no clue what the hell you're doing, how can you say you follow it? You know, when a king goes into battle in the old days, they knew where their enemy was, or they'll just be sitting on the field twiddling their thumbs, getting itchy with their bow and arrows, trying to kill something. Okay, they have no clue where their enemy is, how they're going to go to war. If you have no clue what you're practicing, if you have no clue what you're going to focus your mind on, you're going to say the Tao is this effervescent, everlasting, all-permeating thing that is and isn't, and then all of a sudden, virtue has nothing to do with it. Really? Okay, chop someone's head off and see if you are you can actually quote unquote enter the Tao. You can't do it. You need virtue. 
He's talking, these are different practices, but these are all within the same thing. Those who do not trust sufficiently, others have no trust in them. I'm going to read it up, you know, from bottom up. Those who are with loss, loss is also pleased to have them. Those who are with virtue, virtue is also pleased to have them. Those who are with the Tao, the Tao is also pleased to have them. Doesn't mean the Tao is some type of being that is just smiling, going, Oh, you're so great. Thank you. I want to have you with me. Or virtue is just some vibrational force that just says, Oh, this feels good. Let's have more people feel this way. No, this is all the, first, the last three sentences right under uh, the Tao is also pleased to have them. The last ones, you know, you have virtue, you have loss, and you have do not trust. <sighs> These are methods of practice. He's telling you what your intent is, what you're focusing on here. Okay, those who do not trust sufficiently, others have no trust in them. If you can't trust people, that means if you're not a nice person, if not, not just nice, but if you're not a decent human being, if you're not someone who people can trust, or you can't even trust yourself, you know you lie to yourself, other people will feel that. They'll know that. You're not welcome there. That's not. If people don't like you, you're not, they're not going to welcome you over to their house for dinner and coffee. <laughs> those who are with loss, loss is also pleased to have them. Those who are always, you can say... We'll just use that word, loss, losing, okay? Always messing things up. That state is always welcoming. Why? Because they're only states of mind. You enter them when you put that in your mind, okay? The second you throw a thought in your mind, it manifests and it crystallizes, magnetizes, whatever you want to say it does, and thus it becomes the reality you are with. Those who are with virtue, that becomes their reality too. Those who are with Tao, that becomes their reality too. But the funny thing about that is, the word Tao is this word for every single thing and then nothing. It's this word for all that permeates. Excuse me. All that permeates every single direction. But then there is no direction permeated. I'm going to leave that as a riddle. Now, it holds everything within it. But there's nothing that is holding. Okay? Now, if, if there is no conception then there's no idea of what is going to be cultivated. So remember, people, you really have to get focused on what it is that we're going to cultivate. If you're just going to say, I, I'm the Taoist, what the hell does that mean? What is your main idea of cult cultivation as a Taoist? Is it, you know, scrambled eggs and bacon every morning? <laughs> you know, is it, uh, I'm being so silly, but serious. What is it that we do? Because we as human beings, we do things. And whatever we do, we are. So if someone's going to say, you can't be a Taoist because there's nothing that says you are a Taoist. It's just a specific way of living. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Okay. And, and j just looking at it again, like you read it from the bottom up, it's, it's pretty much a, ba a pathway to the Tao, right? Like mm -hmm. first you have to have trust and then you have to have, uh, I guess, trust in loss or I guess you could say letting go of attachments then you can find mm -hmm. virtue and once you find virtue mm -hmm. then you can enter the Tao mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes 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 that's why I read it upside down or backwards not upside down yeah. <laughs> I read it from bottom up standing, I read it standing on your head I, I, yeah I was going to think about I was thinking about doing that but then I have to read it from the last word all the way and that would be silly <laughs> <laughs> so we can just say all in a nutshell in about five, let, five words uh, or four words inner wisdom brings non-discrimination when you're not discriminating, you realize what is. But you don't have to sit there going, oh, that's what it is. No, it just doesn't happen that way. Okay, well, let's move on to chapter 24. Moving on up. <laughs> Moving on up to the east side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those who are on tiptoes cannot stand. Those who straddle cannot walk. Those who flaunt themselves are not clear. Those who presume themselves are not distinguished. Those who praise others, sorry, those who yeah. praise themselves have no merit. Those who boast about themselves do not last. Those with the Tao call such things leftover food or tumors. They despise them. Thus, those who possess the Tao do not engage in them. Oh, oh, this is funny. Okay, so I'll ask a question and then I'll sum it up in two words. So, those who are on tiptoes cannot stand. Those who straddle cannot walk. Those who flaunt themselves are not clear and so on and so forth. If there is a who that does these things, then there is one who is on tiptoes and cannot stand. There is one who straddles and cannot walk. One who floats themselves and are not clear. There is one who presumes themselves and are not distinguished. 
This one who praises themselves but has no merit, and one who boasts about themselves and does not last. That's if there was an actual who, if there was an actual I. <laughs> That's why he goes on to say, those with the Tao call themselves, call such things, uh, such things leftover food or tumors. They despise them. <laughs> those who possess the Tao do not engage in them. So here's the question. An I? Who is this who? Those who cultivate really know straight up that there is, and here's a sum up in all, all of chapter 24, sum up in, uh, 24 is sum up in two words. No self. <laughs> if there was a self, and there, then there's an attachment to a self, and then since there's going to be an attachment to a self, then you're going to have a whole bunch of adversities. Having these thoughts is like eating bad food. Having these thoughts is like having a cancer. Having such attachments is just like having this growth on your butt. No matter how skinny you look, you still got this growth on your butt. No matter what you wear, those pants are going to have a bulge in your butt. <laughs> because you got this thing sticking up there and it's nasty looking. <laughs> and sometimes can send out an odor and pus and all that fun stuff. That's what an attachment to a self is like. It's like saying... This wonderful thing I got here full of bones, skin, blood, and cells, and DNA, and tendons, and ligaments, and all the fun stuffs and whatnot, it smells so good. If it smells so good, why do you got to take a shower? If it smells so good, why do you need deodorant? <laughs> if it's all perfect, why do you cut your hair? <laughs> you know, if it's, you know, 100% wonderful, why when you're physically dead, the body decomposes and stinks? What is it rot? Something's wrong here with our ideas. <laughs> As Master Shmuel wow, would say, it's a stinking skin bag. But then everyone's <laughs> going to go, oh my God, Buddhists just hate the body. And no, we don't. And no, they don't. And I'm sorry, that's a wrong view. It's a mannerism of practice. Saying this body's a stinking bag of bones actually puts in the mind the fire, fighting fire with fire. Now, I, I heard... I heard before <clears throat> that uh, the Buddha had originally given this practice to people to kind of look at the physical body as a, you know, as a disgusting, stinking carcass. But I, I had heard that a lot of monks actually ended up killing themselves from this meditation. So he, <laughs> did, is, is there any truth to that? <clears throat> I don't know. I haven't heard. I you know I, I haven't read more than probably about I don't know seven or eight sutras in my lifetime so far. But um, who knows? I, I, I wouldn't be able to say whether that's true or not, but that would be an aesthetic practice. I mean, there's a set of practice of sitting in a graveyard cultivating, you know, just to remind yourself, this is going to be you one day. <laughs> it's like, get your ass to work and start getting some enlightenment going on here, you know, <laughs> wake up. <laughs> um, but it could be a practice. I don't know if it's true or not, um, but there's merit to it. You... Um, Drop all attachments to the physical body so you don't hold on, so you can be set free in your mind. And why that's important? It's very important to be set free in your mind because that's where everything I, comes from. I know um, in, in my own life, I've used that meditation <clears throat> or that, uh, that way of thinking to overcome, say, lustful thoughts and, and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the other person and you look at them and you break, you know, instead of seeing them as this manufactured uh, lusty image, you break down what that other being actually is. Mm. Right. I mean, when you see what the body actually is, you say, go, do I really want to put something in there? <laughs> and the women are going to be like, do I really want that thing inside there? <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> truthfully sorry <clears throat> I still got a little congestion um, truthfully we really gotta observe this stuff that's how you can cut out your sexual desire and you're gonna go hey wait a second someone's gonna say that's not natural but who said sex is natural you think it's natural human people think it's a natural human type of uh, situation going on animals do it why would you want to follow animals for I mean really they lick their own butt <laughs> I don't want to taste my own butt. <laughs> you know, why do we want to follow animals for? It doesn't make sense. Um, but seriously, people think that sex is just some natural thing that happens. It's part of a human nature. Really? Who said that? Someone who's attached to sex? I don't want to believe them. I'd rather not believe someone who has a belief in what they do. Why? Because then it's a bias. 
How do I know it's true? How do I know there's nothing else behind it? Well, you don't, unless you sit there and really investigate the mind and say, hey, someone said that this is uh, human nature to have sex. I should go out and have as much sex as possible. Screw this whole monogamy business. Let's have millions of wives or just sex partners. That's the way nature is. Monkeys do it. <laughs> Animals do it. Let's follow them because that's nature. No, it's not. It's human conditioning. We're, be- we're taught to believe that that's natural. But we don't even know where these things come from. You don't know where your, phys- your, your physical, emotional uh, drive comes from. Who can tell me where the sexual uh, desire comes from? Find out where that comes from. When you find out where that comes from, you realize it's, uh, you're going to realize what it is. I'm not going to say what it is. You'll realize what it is. It's going to go, holy crap. <laughs> I remember I was five years old and I was told this. And before five years old, I never had a thought about it. And afterwards, that's when everything changed. <laughs> you know? So really... Some things are really interesting to investigate. And just because one gets an answer in their investigation right away, it doesn't mean that that's exactly the right answer. You got to keep going. Keep going. Never stop. So chapter 24 says no self. If you don't have a self, then you can stand. You can walk. You are very clear. There's nothing to be distinguished. You have merit. Everything is neither coming nor going. And that's what the Tao is. That's what the sages go towards, the no-self. Okay, so let's move on to 25. Oh, yeah, the long one. Yeah, I'll take a deep breath here. <sighs> um, okay. <laughs> there is something formlessly created, born before heaven and earth, so silent, so ethereal, independent and changeless, circulating and ceaseless. It can be regarded as the mother of the world. I do not know its name. Identifying it, I call it Tao. Forced to describe it, I call it Great. Great means passing. Passing means receding. Receding means returning. Therefore, the Tao is great. Heaven is great. Earth is great. The Sovereign is also great. There are four greats in the universe, and the Sovereign occupies one of them. Humans follow the laws of the Earth. Earth follows the laws of Heaven. Heaven follows the laws of the Tao. And the Tao follows the laws of nature. Cool. Yeah, this one's probably a little on the deeper end. Yeah, that's why I'm I'm only using about eleven words to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but <clears throat> sorry. Excuse my coughing. Got a little congestion. <laughs> Hold on one second. Hi, welcome back. <laughs> so, um. Let's go on the bottom again. The last four sentences. Humans follow the laws of the earth. Earth follows the laws of heaven. Heaven follows the laws of Tao. Tao follows the laws of nature. Now, we can go very literal and go, humans follow the laws of earth. I, I skip all the, uh, the uh, uh, things on top there because we're going to get to that later. I like okay. the bottom first. <clears throat> humans follow the laws of earth. Who knows the laws of earth? Who studies Taoism? Earth follows the laws of heaven. They haven't followed Earth. If they don't know the laws of Earth, how the hell do they know anything about Heaven? If they don't know anything about Heaven, they don't know how Heaven follows the laws of the Tao. That means they don't even know what the laws of the Tao are. And if we're going up here on the pyramid, and Tao follows the laws of nature, then what nature is the Tao following? So first, a question and a quick you know, slap with a chan stick, you know, to, even to myself, <laughs> if we don't know the laws of the Earth... Not man-made laws, not societal laws, laws of earth. That means put your hands on a tree, cut out your discriminatory thinking, and listen. If you don't know that, you're not knowing anything about what heaven is like. You won't know anything about what the Tao is, and you have no clue what manner of nature the Tao follows. I taught one of my students how to listen. And just recently something started coming like he started getting something he started feeling it you know when you listen to earth and you listen to the nature of earth you need to cut out discriminative thinking everyone myself included everything you must cut out discriminative thinking you won't know because we're going to have our own, if we have our own intellectual ideas about the way things are you're not going to get exactly how the way things are which is still going to have a filter. You want to take the filter of that, of that conscious mind out. What is the world without your views of it? That's what we're throwing out. 
the whole entire basket of worldviews we've created since childhood. Dump it out. Don't recycle them. <laughs> Don't shred them because they become more pollutants. Just transform them by realization. And things change. Then you really see what is the way of nature. But what nature is it that we're talking about here on Earth? Is it the way the plants grow? Is it the way animals behave? I mean, they have their own consciousness, so they're not really, you know, nature-wise. They just do things according to their karmic behavior, their karmic nature. Humans, on the other hand, are the same way, actually, but they have a reasoning mind. They have the consciousness, the karmic conditions to actually discriminate, whether it's wise discrimination or um, ignorant discrimination. There's a difference. So when we, we we're trying to understand things, it's not that you're going to sit there and go, okay, Earth, we should not cut down trees. Okay, okay, be nice. <laughs> then we shouldn't go out hunting animals <laughs> because that's killing a life. You can say in, in the nature of Earth, uh, animals kill each other. No, 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 no. That's the nature of animals, not the nature of this planet. Find out the laws of this planet. What is the way this planet functions as? That's what you follow. If you want to follow the laws of animals then by all means, you know, go down on all fours and walk around like an animal. That's it. <laughs> so um, the law of nature of this planet, who said it has anything to do with the way the birds fly? Who said it has anything to do with the way the animals treat themselves in their own entire, you know, wherever they live? Or the way insects do or whatever the case is. Who said it has anything to do with that? Each living being has its consciousness, has its own conscious vibration. It has its own karmic nature, and they revolve within that. That's why we want to jump off of our cycle of karmic conditions. We do that by realization. Ah, uh, but besides all that fun stuff, <laughs> now let's look at this. So remember, we have to know what Earth, the laws of Earth, the laws. Of, then we'll know the laws of heaven. Then we'll know the laws of Tao, and then we'll know the laws of nature. We'll understand what actual nature they're talking about. If I tell you, it'll just become an intellectual thing. Who says I actually know anyway? Now we go up. <laughs> uh, there is something formlessly created before heaven and earth, so silent, so ethereal, independent and changeless, circulating and ceaseless. It can be regarded as the mother of the world. Cool. Is it just mean, does it just mean our planet? Or maybe the world doesn't mean the actual physical place. Because if we actually knew what makes this world the way it is, we would actually understand that Maybe Lalz is not talking about the physical, actual planet of this world. Maybe he's talking about the mind. Hmm. Maybe that's he's saying all the that. Ah, uh, that's a little, little far out there, probably. But I mean, if you really wanted to go to Mars and see if there's anything going on in that planet or on the planet itself, why not just go and meditate, develop the skill, and go take a look? Why not go to Jupiter and see if it's actually gigantic the way it's said? <laughs> Why don't you go to Saturn? Why don't you go to other planets and other galaxies? Because people don't want to apply themselves. They don't think it's even possible. They doubt because they think their mind is only confined to the space around them or even the physical body. Well, perhaps that is for them. And that's their world. Ah, wait a second. So maybe that's what he meant too. The world is just the mind. Because each person has their own world. Today I was talking with the... Uh, a brother for a uh, Chen style Tai Chi, we're talking about empty force and how he can't believe, he doesn't believe it. And I said, that's okay, you know. I was discussing with it that I've seen and I experienced and, you know, I, I know some people who can do stuff like that. Um, not at will, but at will giving a sp specific situation, um, life and death situation, you know, uh, some things will happen. And he's like, oh man, you know. I, I can't play. I know it's you telling me, and I know you don't bullshit me, but man, you know, I still can't really put my put my you know belief into it. I said, no, you don't have to. You know, that's my world. <clears throat> my world is totally weird. <laughs> Your world is never. <clears throat> Sorry. So I said, yeah, it's just just the way it is for you. So Lanza could be pointing out when he says here in the above few sentences, then it can be got, regarded as the mother of the world. That it, maybe he's talking about our mind. Because our world is only, you know, as it is due to what we have the capacity to accept it as. 
mean, really, people want to be concerned with other things in other countries, but they can't even apply their mind to what's going on around them. They can't even function this. They can't even make their immediate surroundings function in a quote-unquote harmonious way or stable way. Uh, so the world can be here in our mind. But where is here and where is everywhere else? Got to cultivate to find out if there is anything <laughs> such like that. So we can take this whole entire entire chapter 25 and I'm, I'm leaving the la the middle parts because i mean we know what it's i know i i do not know its name identify it i call it Tao, and blah 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 he goes on contain, continuing here so that's good stuff all in all nutshell inherent wisdom the original nature which pervades all directions all realms <laughs> that's what he's talking about the inherent nature that whole entire what he'll call Tao that um, um, that permeates every single nook and cranny of every single universe world and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> that's what he's talking about. Okay. And that's what even the Buddha and, and other immortals would talk about as being space without any type of uh, discriminating thinking. Okay. Very fun. We'll move on to 26. Oh, yeah. All right. Heaviness is the root of lightness. Quietness is the master of restlessness. Therefore, the sages travel an entire day without leaving the heavy supplies. Even though there are luxurious sights, they are composed and transcend beyond. How can the lords of 10,000 chariots apply themselves lightly to the world? To be light is to lose one's root. To be restless is to lose one's mastery. <laughs> in, in, in there, I mean, we obviously see uh, the yin and yang, right? The opposites. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, screaming relativity. S screaming relativity, yin and yang right there. And outflows. <laughs> when we focus on things with our senses, we are pulling energy out of our body. It's like sending energy out. And we'll consider that an outflow and cultivation. Then whenever how we react to what we see that's an outflow as well. So that creates conditions to have more karmic situations manifest. Isn't that funny? So he's going, uh, he's going here. Heaviness is a root of lightness. Quietness is the master of restlessness. Restlessness. This is dual thinking. This is relativity, yin and yang. If you're sitting down in meditation and you feel pain in your legs, you feel itchy on your forehead, your back is cramping up, your lower back is feeling painful, and you're sitting there going, I can't do this, gritting your teeth, that's good. That means you inhale it all right in, and you focus just a little bit longer, maybe an extra 30 seconds, and you'll probably last another minute or two. And you keep going. What actually stops you from continuing is this view in the mind that says there's a you that feels pain. <laughs> Though there is something happening that is painful, there's still an attachment to an I, my God, I feel the pain. You know, I am in pain. My legs are hurting. Oh, my goodness. And that itself magnifies the pain more. Yeah, that uh, brings to mind my, my last trip to Peru. Um, we were climbing up a mountain. And the oxygen is so thin. We were, you know, 13 or 14,000 feet above sea level. And, uh, you know, you can take about 10 steps and then all of a sudden you got to sit down and rest oh wow. and we were you know maybe halfway up the mountain and it was like gosh can we even make this and then you know i had this thought that came into my mind and then it said you know the body's not what's defeating you it's your own mind and i just kind of said okay well i'm just going to accept that and, and keep pressing on and, and try not to focus on the pain and the and then and the you fatigue. became lightheaded and felt <laughs> and then i fell down the mountain <laughs> But, but you know you know what I'm saying, right? So essentially, it's just sort of putting that, yeah, putting the pain aside or kind of overcoming it. It's it's really investigating where the source of it is, and the source of it is is in your own mind. Yes, I was having lunch with my coworkers in our school cafeteria the other day, and they were like, "Oh, you know, when you went back to New York, how was the food? And you know, did you get did you have a problem adjusting to the food?" And I said, "Absolutely." <laughs> you know, I I had a not a very comfortable experience with my stomach when I went back to New York eating, you know, the food again. It was just, it didn't feel comfortable. I had to, we had to buy our food from um, another a grocery store this time and had to cook our own vegetables and stuff and make our own style food because I, I got physically used to uh, the food out here in China. It's been that way for a while. I thought I would eat food like I would 
you know, in America anyway, it's still not used to the way it's made or whatever the case is. So they're like, oh, wow, so there's different types of nutrition. They're telling me all this stuff. And I said, you know what? It really matters this way. If you're in a good mood today, your whole body is in a good mood. That means your cells and all the functions and systems of the body are doing everything happily. No matter what you're eating, <laughs> you'll get all the nutrients you need. But you're sitting there going, I hate my life, and you, you know, chewing down a whole vegetarian hamburger, you're not going to get any benefits from that hamburger. Or if you're eating a regular type of hamburger, uh, you're not getting any benefits anyway. Your body is not functioning at its optimal vibration. You're not getting any type of benefit from anything else around you. So no matter what the hell we're eating, it's really your state of mind. I mean, when I went back, I mean, truthfully, some things just, you know, really screw you up physically when you eat them. <laughs> you know? I mean, I didn't go back all, la-di-da, everything's happy, the world is beautiful. No, I'm not like that. I'm actually like that, skipping around like I have flowers coming out of my ass or something. You know? <laughs> but um, when I went back, uh, just a regular plate of spaghetti and uh, tomato sauce, you know, the acidic. The, the acid of the tomato sauce really gave me up. <laughs> it had nothing to do with it. I was in a great freaking mood too. But I was sitting there looking at it going, oh my God, I know what's going to happen. And lo and behold, it did happen. But it, regardless if I thought about it or not, I know that that's just what happens. There's so much acidity for me in the tomato sauce, maybe the way it's homemade or something. Even if you get it in the jar, it still causes problems. So some things are right up in the mind. I mean, if someone shoots you, yeah, you're going to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's say it's all a matter of the mind. <laughs> I don't feel the bullet. No, you're going to feel it. That's pretty intense. Some things are just straightful intense. But if you have a strong mind, probably, I'm not going to say what, what could or could not happen. I would like to, let's just put the sake of imagination, you know. Maybe it just doesn't hit you. Or maybe, it, not that it stops in midair and you're like Neo in the Matrix going, no. <laughs> and then it just stops there and you can play with it. No, no, no. All I'm saying is perhaps it, the pain that you feel through, through some traumatic situation is not as intense as it would be for most people. But it still hurt like hell. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you know? I mean, I get scratches and bruises. I don't even know how the hell I get them. Uh, then when I go back to look at what I did that day, I said, oh, yeah, that could have happened that way. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Handing someone a bottle that was broken, I didn't know, and just cuts up my hand. And I, I give it to them. I don't even realize I'm bleeding. I just don't feel it. And they're like, "Oh my God, you don't feel that?" I'm like, "Oh, oh." <laughs> when I look at it and say, "Oh, I'm cut," now I felt it. <laughs> so I just put my herbal my herbal um, paste on it and wrap it up. Two days, it's gone. No scar, no nothing. That's the beauty of Chinese herbal medicine, right? <laughs> so it's just anyway. because your your mind's not in the habit of attaching to the uh, pain it's or practice as well, right? And it's not that you got brainwashed. There's no such thing as brainwashing and cultivation. It's simply transformation and cultivation. So here we go further in chapter twenty six, putting down false thinking and attachments. Woohoo! That's what he's going at. Relativity and outflows. He's telling you about relativity and outflows, meaning relativity, you know, yin and yang and all the fun stuff. Outflows is when we send our attention outwards and it creates a karmic uh, condition where we will experience its opposite. Uh, we waste our energy, basically. Uh, and putting down false thinking and attachments. It's just going on with that. Really fun stuff. Chapter 26. Okay. Well, let's carry on to 27. Oh, yeah. Good traveling does not leave tracks. Good speech does not sink, seek faults. Good reckoning does not use counters. Good closure needs no bar and yet cannot be opened. Good knot needs no rope and yet cannot be untied. Therefore, sages often save others and so do not abandon anyone. They often save things and so do not abandon anything. This is called following enlightenment. Therefore, the good person is the teacher of the bad person. The bad person is the resource of the good person. Those who do not value their teachers and do not love their resources, although intelligent, they are greatly confused. This is called the essential wonder. Mm. It's a good chapter, too. They're all good chapters. They all good chapters. Some just scream, you know. Ah, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> well, look at the first sentence quickly. You know, good traveling does not leave track. Someone's going to go, hmm, does that mean when I'm walking I shouldn't leave footprints? <laughs> no, it means, it means wherever you go, don't cause problems. 
<laughs> okay. Don't go out and like uh, argue with people like great big problems where you'll have these – how do I say – karmic conditions in a negative manner with people. Also, do not do things with people where you would have a karmic condition that leaves you attached to a specific space, a specific place. Okay, don't go to places and cause situations where you would find yourself attached to them, where people will find themselves attached to you. So he says in early chapters, the sage does things and makes people feel like they accomplished. That's good. Um, good speech does not seek faults. Oh, it speaks perfect for itself. You have nothing good to say. Don't say anything. <laughs> no matter how right you are, if you can't say it in a, in a way that just gets to the point without causing people more false thinking of thinking, oh, he thinks I'm an idiot, then don't say anything at all. There's no reason to say something anyway in the first place. Uh, for example, there's people who don't like me because I just don't take people's nonsense. They do all their nest. They're all crazy talking all they want online or in people's faces or wherever they go and talk bad about me. I could, don't care. <laughs> I don't care because it's not true, number one. If it was true, I would make sure that I changed my habits, but that's just not the case. And, and a lot of times they just want a reaction to keep feeding oh, the fire, right? That's called – yeah, exactly. If one goes out and confronts these people or argues with them, then you're creating outflow. You're, you're giving in to this type of a parasitic kind of like energy. It's just this black hole of craziness just sucks your energy in. You become so low in vibration – then no matter how right you are, people will still believe you are no good because your emotional field, your vibrational field is so low that you just don't look good. And so your reactions and the way you're going to hold yourself will not be in line with a proper way of holding oneself. <laughs> okay, so truthfully, who cares? It doesn't matter. Uh, good reckoning does not use counters. There you go. Good closure needs no bar. <laughs> it cannot be opened. <laughs> Putting down attachments, right? Good knot needs no rope and can and yet cannot be untied. <laughs> okay. So it's just basically no attachments. Let's go down here. Sage often saves others and so does not abandon anyone. Only that which is in their mind can they save. So that they go to all different places all around the world, helping people and every single living being and every ant and roach and every insect and animal in the ocean and the, in the jungles and wherever. No. Just saying that all that which is within the mind of the sage, that's who he can accompany. They often save things and so do not abandon anything. What are they saving? They're not saving their favorite car. They're not saving their favorite shoe or favorite underwear. <laughs> you know, what are they saving? Their energy, that which counts. So, if you're saving that which vib that which is in vibration through this physical body, that means you are not wasting any bit of it. I mean, that's every single thing you need to save. That's all that's important. <laughs> they don't abandon it. They don't let it go. They don't wastefully let their energy go all over the place. This is called following enlightenment, and these. If, Four sentences before following enlightenment. These four sentences right there give you a whole entire like manual on how to cultivate it. I don't know how people don't see that. It's just going right into selflessness, but right into all that which is within your mind is the world. Whatever you can conceive of, whoever is in affinities with you, that's who you work with. Okay? And so do not abandon anyone. Therefore, that which is in your capacity to understand... Uh, those who are within your affinity, sphere of affinities, those who are the ones you associate with. Okay? Save things. What if that saving is? Sage doesn't have things. I mean, they have things, but they're not like, these are my things, don't touch them. You know, they may have a house to live in. Who knows? Maybe you're ultra rich and have like 10 million Ferraris. Who cares? But that's just for them to utilize. I mean, they can run their Ferrari off the bridge who or all they or all they care. They don't they don't mind. But that's not the point. The point is what are they saving? That which matters most, our our essence, our energy. Saving our life force. Oh. Saving our mind. Oh. Cultivating so we can open up our inherent wisdom 
so we don't have to keep going through the same nonsense we keep going through all the times. Ah, but if you're doing that, then your energy is going back in. You're illuminating your senses in. You are saving yourself. Ah, realizing there is no self at that point, you can become enlightened over time. Oh, so wait, wait, Taoism talks about enlightenment? Oh my goodness, what is this? You know? <laughs> and that's, and he that's goes, actually a, a typo. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> That's a perfect typo for us. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, people just talk very loud here. <laughs> Even when they're right in front of you. <laughs> right in front of you, they talk like, uh, you know, they have a microphone on. Um, so he goes on to further talk about, you know, teacher is a teacher of a bad person, a good teacher to a bad person, a bad person is a resource to a good teacher. Of course, it's a resource for a good teacher because the teacher, you know, needs to know uh, how not to be and then needs to know what methods that he can use to teach this specific person. So they work hand in hand, okay? And he goes, those who do not value their teachers and do not love their resources – although intelligent, are greatly confused. This is called the essential wonder. It's just like, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? If you have a teacher who's really, really good at, good at doing what he's doing, and really, really focus on you and really teaching you, and then you're just like, ah, screw this and ah, screw that, then you're missing out something very special. So you could be extremely smart and very clever with how you practice and really getting further ahead. You just turn around and go, ah, oh, my teacher has no clue what the hell he's talking about. That's a little... Reduc redu uh, retarded, <laughs> ridiculous, you know, <laughs> it's a little ridiculous here because it, it, you may not know that a teacher is good. It reminds me of a story of a monk who had a teacher who only taught him what was a recitation of bowing all the time. And he's like, oh, I really want to get ahead. I really want to go further. I want more methods. I want to practice. I want to practice. So he told his teacher, I want to go and leave the temple here. I want to go to meet Manjushri out in his temple. And the monk was like, uh, okay, fine. Before you leave, before you actually go to the temple, I want you to stop off at a place for me, okay? He writes a letter. Go to this woman and go to her place and, and, and send her this letter for me. And the kid is like, really? Wow, the master knows a lady, a woman, has a woman friend? Okay. <laughs> I think she was a, uh, a prostitute or she was a woman who took care of pigs. Either or. Um, probably one of the same. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway. <clears throat> Sorry. So on the way, he stops off. He gives the woman the, the letter. She reads it. Oh, my God. Okay, okay, okay. All right. I understand. Thank you. And, and, and you know, he goes on his way to Manchester Street. Well, he goes and finds himself to going to the temple and on his way up to the mountain or whatever. And when he gets there, he meets, uh, he comes across this old man, white hair, I guess bald or whatever. And the guy's like, hey, little one. <laughs> He's like, hey, how you doing? Where are you going? Oh, I'm going, I come from such and such temple. I'm here to see, uh, I want to cultivate and find Manjushri Bodhisattva, you know? I really want to, uh, this happened in China, but I'm using the, the, the English way of explaining it. And he goes, really? You're from this temple? Oh, you came all this way just to meet Manjushri. Ah, uh, so, so sad, so sad. He goes, what the hell are you talking about? You had such a grand teacher. <laughs> your teacher, you didn't even know your teacher was Amitabha Buddha. <laughs> and the woman he had you go to, <laughs> that was Guanyin Bodhisattva. <laughs> the letter you said you gave to her was uh, such and such... Um, you know, Guan Yin, I'm on my way out. My disciple has left me, so I don't have a reason to stay here anymore. I'm going back. Come back with me. So she left. <laughs> and the guy disappeared. <laughs> it was the, the guy right in front of the kid. And he just, like, left. He disappeared. Just disappeared. He later found out that that old man was a manifestation of Manjushri Bodhisattva. So here this kid was all, my teacher sucks. And now he found out his teacher was Amitabha Buddha, and the woman he gave a letter to was Guanyin Bodhisattva. And here he wanted to run back to find his teacher, but his teacher had already gone. You know, then he finds out that that old guy was man, actually Manjushri. So you really don't know. And this sign here, I mean, this sentence, sorry, 
only speaks – and I don't think this means teachers like English teachers, martial art teachers, uh, yoga teachers, so to say. It means cultivation. Cultivation. You can take it on a, a, a step down. What I'll say – don't look too deep into what I mean here. But when I say, say step down, I just mean in the regular world of like uh, ordinary teachers and students, you know, whether it be academic or whether it be sports, you know, like martial arts or football or something like that. If you have a good teacher who really looks out for you and tries to teach you stuff, that's good too. And then you could take it on that level and say, oh, well, I don't like the way my teacher teaches or blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to find the new teacher. And you find out that your teacher was had a PhD and actually – you know, a lot of students under this person succeeded very well in life. Oh, now you regret a little bit. Okay. Same thing with the martial art teachers. Maybe they're good teachers um, and you just don't like them. You go out and find another one. There's a dime a dozen. You know, you can find martial art teachers almost anywhere. Um, but remember, just because a person's a martial art teacher, it doesn't mean that they're enlightened. You know, just because they know how to fight doesn't mean they're smart at all. It doesn't mean they're aligned at all. So don't, you know, a lot of people mistaken this too. Well, they'll find a Tai Chi teacher or any type of martial art teacher and think that they're enlightened or they're some special type of person because they know how to fight someone very well. They know how to move very smoothly. That's called proficiency in what you do. There's nothing spectacular about that. It doesn't mean the person is enlightened. So, you know, very rarely you'll have a martial artist who actually knows, knows a thing or two or is actually enlightened about cultivation um, but anyway what it means here is if you're getting something that's beneficial you must recognize it as such if you are not then you must go on and do not criticize or do not throw what you've learned out you must cultivate further and here he's talking straight up on cultivation so you must really have to open your mind here and this whole entire passage is going interdependence how things in the relative world are interdependent and how to keep a right view of the interactions basically so he's talking about the interdependency of all things here mm, yeah i could say a few things but in, in terms of time i'll just we'll skip the chapter 28 or move on to chapter 28 not skip i guess <laughs> yeah all right okay know the masculine hold the feminine be the water course of the we of the world being the water course of the world, the eternal virtue does not depart. Return to the state of the infant. Know the white, hold the black. Be the standard of the world. Being the standard of the world, the eternal virtue does not deviate. Return to the state of the boundless. Know the honor, hold the humility. Be the valley of the world. Being the valley of the world, the eternal virtue shall be sufficient. Return to the state of the plain wood. Plain wood splits, then becomes tools. The sage utilizes them and then become leaders. Thus, the greater whole is undivided. Oh, fun. Oh, man, this is screaming the title of our show. <laughs> yeah, I'm also <laughs> seeing a lot of, seeing a lot of uh, cultivation stuff. In, well, I mean, that's in a whole Tao Te Ching, but in terms of internal uh, cultivation, I see that, a lot of that in here. Yeah, there's a lot of terminology that's being thrown here. You know, especially beginning a whole, all the masculine, holds the feminine, be the watercress of the world, and so on and so forth. Um, I guess we don't have to go too far into that. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there, whether they're good or not. Uh, not my point to say. <laughs> but um, let's just go on here. This is screaming expedient means. <laughs> we should be saying this at the end of each show now. Chapter 28. <laughs> this is the epi epitome of our show. <laughs> too big a mouthful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Yeah, it is. It's a big mouthful, actually. Understanding expedience, everyone. Situations experienced in the world are utilized as ways to awaken and help others. Going through internal cultivation, going through just how to deal with people in daily life, and going through the things that you use or the kind of work or lifestyle you have in society. Because whenever there's a group of people, there's going to be socialness. There's going to be a society. So regardless, if you live with the community in the woods... You're still a community. <laughs> it's still a small little society there. You know, even a group of cultivators is a sangha, whether you say it in English or Chinese or Indian or Taoist terminology, terminologies or whatnot, it's still a group of cultivators. Okay, so um, 
it's understanding what the methods are that you're utilizing, uh, the conditions you face, and how to apply them. So he's really screaming here that everything we experience is all an expedient to awaken. And how to utilize that awakening to help others. He's just speaking about selflessness, I mean, since chapter one, and non-discrimination and pervading all directions and as the original nature, but just using the word thou and whatever the case is. I mean, it's a reoccurring theme here. Shall we go on? <laughs> sure. All right. Well, Do you have quick... anything to say on that one? Yeah, this is kind of quick. Uh, no, I'll just keep it to myself, I guess. Um, oh, just... All right, so we'll yes, carry on to chapter 29. Yeah, quick one. Uh, that was quick. Yeah. Those who wish... Six words. What's that? I only have six words for this one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Those who wish to take the world and control it, I see that they cannot succeed. The world is a sacred instrument. One cannot control it. The one who controls it will fail. The one who grasps it will lose. Because all things either let lead or follow, either blow hot or cold, either have strength or weakness, either have ownership or take by force. Therefore, the sage eliminates extremes, eliminates excess, eliminates arrogance. You know, when I read this, uh, this isn't the commentary, but it's a commentary. I mean, I, I summed it all up in six words, including the words to and and. <laughs> and, a <comma. laughs> uh, and a period. But anyway, when I see this, I sit there and go, the last four sentences there is, say, therefore a sage uh, eliminates extremes, eliminates excess, and eliminates arrogance. When I see that, I think, damn, if there are people who read this chapter as well. <laughs> you know? I mean, we can go far into explaining about, oh, this is talking about politics, and it's talking about this and that situation in our world, and it's amazing how the Tao Te Ching, written as many thousand years ago it was written, I don't know. <laughs> I'm being very whatever about it. Because we already know how you know, all the people describe, oh, it's 2,000 years old, it's 2,500 years old. You know, it's before the Buddha. Actually, the Buddha was about 3,200 and change or 3,300 and change through the Chinese calendar. I don't remember about Lao Tzu. Anywho, um, or through the calendar that they used then in those times. Anyway, <laughs> we can go into talking about all that stuff and miss the point. The point is, and here's the golden commentary of... Six words. Nah, seven words, sorry. Keeping to right views and maintaining virtue. <laughs> mm. And we spoke about right views in our commentary and the uh, eight uh, noble truths. Uh, why, why does this have anything to do with eight noble truths? Everything can be interrelated to everything. So don't sit there and go, oh, he's just utilizing it from a Buddhist perspective. No, I'm utilizing it from a cultivation perspective. Anything that benefits us in cultivation is useful for cultivation. Anything that doesn't benefit, in, and it, uh, benefit us in cultivation is garbage. Benefit means which way? Not throwing money in your pocket, not making people praise you. It means getting to the goal. And what is the goal? Awaken, enlighten yourself, and become all wise and all powerful it's getting <laughs> become very wise Not yeah, that, that, that's a much more profound uh, interpretation than mine because uh, my interpretation was uh, let's hang the bankers <laughs> sure I mean you know we can do that and it'll become a revolution we could just make a whole new type of Tao Te Ching commentary called the revolutionary Tao Te Ching uh, yeah, called revolutionary Taoists I bet you we could I bet you I'm. you know what I can make a religion, and I guarantee people will follow it. The revolutionary Taoist, based on the Tao Te Ching and how to utilize it for society and the manner of changing the laws and government. You know how fast people will believe this? I bet you we can make a religion. I'm, I'm sure someone around somewhere who hears this is going to go, let's do that. That's pretty good. Cool. Don't give anybody any ideas. I hope no one does it because then it'll become like uh, some religion out there. I'm not going to say what, but. You know, it was actually a bet made, and then all of a sudden they made a religion out of, about it. And the guy who wanted to come clean about it was, I think, threatened to keep his mouth shut because it became too intense. So please, people, do not become, do not make a type of group called the Revolutionary Taoists. If it already exists, okay. 
But if it doesn't, please do not say I didn't have anything to do with this. I'm just making a joke. <laughs> so keeping to right views and maintaining virtue. If you do that, you won't do crazy, stupid things that hurt every single human or every other living being or even this planet and other planets and other beings from other planets. You won't hurt them. You won't cause problems. You will understand how everything is interdependent and why you should not just purposely do things to cause problems for people. Plain and simple. Not that you go and hand out things for people. That's not anyone's job either. But the fact is you don't purposely just poison our water. You know? You don't purposely pollute our oceans. You don't purposely frack the hell out of our lands. <laughs> Stop fracking. You know? Fracking, fracking, fracking. You don't do uh, the, the chemtrails. You don't do these things that just are pointless. Vaccinations with tons and tons of chemicals in there that just cause problems for people's health. And you don't make laws that cover up for companies. You don't. If I was president, which I hope I never become president because I would make a lot of people angry and forget it. I can't have a family if I'm into politics. But if I ever actually was in a position of you know, control of a country's laws and whatnot, oh my God, how many people would be fulfilling filling our, our jail system? How many? Be in re-education, not re-education like torture. <laughs> re-education of I'd actually be a decent person and run a decent company without having to poison our food and mutate our food, okay, and then just, like, screw everybody over in the whole planet. No. How many doctors or how much in the medical association would be in jail? How much in politics would be in jail? I mean, I would probably have so many hits on my head, I would be unbelievable. <laughs> but I'm not in that position, probably for that reason. <laughs> okay, but it's keeping to right views and maintaining virtue. Be a really simple... Be a good person. Really stupid kindergarten, be nice to people kind of situation. And don't hold these uh, psychotic views on how things should be done because they're not being done that way. So you don't have to be bothered about it. Like I walk in the streets every day out here in China and I, it drives me nuts. Yeah, I get driven nuts too. Uh, how people drive, how they walk, and how they ride their bicycles. It just amazes me that they're still alive. <laughs> They're doing something, you know, they're used to it. They know how to run with it and they're fine with it. We come from a different country where, you know, you follow traffic laws. <laughs> People ride a bike, they know not to run you over. People walking know how to be careful, some. Uh, but over here, it's kind of like unheard of. So, you know, it, it's not going to change the right view about it is. If I really need to go shopping, <laughs> grocery shopping, then I just go. If I don't, I stay in the the immediate vicinity. You know, I stay in this specific area where I don't have to go bother myself and go have to uh, don't have to go and bother other people. You know, so I, you hold right views. So if I don't have to go do something, I don't have to do it. I mean, once a week, I go out and do shopping. And other than that, I don't go anywhere. <laughs> I go to the park and practice. <laughs> That's what I do. But you, you work with the conditions around you, maintaining virtue. Not that just being a nice person, but yeah, you can take it so basic. Uh, we can go deep with the virtue. We've spoken about virtue billions of times in our commentary, so we won't go on. Let's move on to chapter 30. Okay, the final one for today. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. The one who uses the Tao to advise the ruler does not dominate the world with soldiers. Such methods tend to be returned. The place where the troops camp, thistles and thorns grow. Following the great army, there must be an in it. Following the great army, there must be an inauspicious year. Good commander achieves results, then stops and does not dare to reach for domination. Achieves results, but does not brag. Achieves results, but does not flaunt. Achieves results, but is not arrogant. Achieves results, but only out of necessity. Achieves results, but does not dominate. Things become strong and then get old. This is called contrary to the Tao. That which is contrary to the Tao soon ends. Yes. Interesting. We're going to take this two ways. One, into cultivation. Two, into actually being someone who's, you know, general and whatever. Let's do that one first. Yeah, the Basically more superficial. Saying, mm, really saying you do what you need to do, meaning that doesn't mean you go out and uh, 
I need to go and blow this guy's head off because that's what the general ordered. No. <laughs> it means actually fighting a war that's actually uh, me meaningful. Not to pockets, not to corporations, meaningful, meaning there's a country right next to ours that's trying to come in and take over and kill loads and loads of people. We have to stop them from hurting these people. Okay, that's why there is a fight. Go out, stop, make them know you can't do that crap. Go back home. And then they go. They know they got beat. Maybe 20, 30 years later, they come back and try it again. And then you go back and do it. You don't just go annihilate all entire people just because one day they're going to come back and try it again. So, so what? That's the, neb that's the ebbs and flows of relativity on our planet. You don't just go make a bomb and blow up a whole entire country, er eradicate the whole entire people just because things happen. Um, 20, 30 years later, they want to come out for a war. So what? Come out for a war. So what? Soldiers die. That's what happens in a war. The soldiers are there to protect. That's their duty. And they become soldiers because that's their karma. Because they chose that. They chose that because of their karma. So that's what happens. No offense or buts about it. No big deal. They go out and they fight. They're heroic. They protect the people in the land. And that's all they need to do. They don't go out devising plans to how to, you know, go take over another country. You know, kill just for the sake of killing. You kill because there's a reason of being killed. In a war, that's what happens. And if you lose the war, meaning you're the side that's protecting, does not, is not good enough at protecting and loses, then the country falls under another person's rule. I think that's just what happens in the war. And it's terrible, but that's just what happens. Uh, so, saying do not do too much. You go in to do what is necessary only to protect, maintain, and be on with your day. You don't go around saying how many people you killed. You don't go around saying I'm this and that type of status. Okay? You don't do things just to get, you know, a higher position. If it falls in your lap that you are in a position to do something and then all of a sudden you get praised for it, that's fine. You know? Yeah, I was going to say you don't uh, manipulate wars for oil profits and such. Oh, you did, yeah, I didn't want to go that far. <laughs> well, we'll leave that one. We'll leave that one for our uh, our conversation on uh, politics, government, government and politics. Oh, that's going to be fun. I probably will never ever get back home after. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be drug away by the end of the show. Oh, uh, jeez, you know. But um, here, this is going into our daily life as well. You know, people are in positions of um, corporate power or positions of uh, social power, you know, political power or just even in our own little uh, organizations. You have positions of uh, authority that you do things to make people praise you a little bit more or like you a little bit better or whatever. These are called climbing on conditions in cultivation. And you don't want to climb on conditions. You don't. Don't want to use other people to get ahead and then try to step on them when you're getting ahead. Uh, or in the process of trying to get ahead of the people who are, quote-unquote, above you in position, you know, you try to step on them because you can't get your way. So you try to destroy their surroundings around you. I mean, this happens all the time. So no matter where you are, no matter what level of society you're in, it happens. People use you to get ahead. And when they can't use you, they try to cause more problems for you, so you fall. And when you don't, all they're stuck is twiddling their thumbs trying to figure out how they can make other people dislike you, which really isn't going to be impossible because it's just ridiculous. So he's saying here, do not climb on conditions. If we're looking at cultivation-wise, this is interesting. Utilize your mind to know where the mind is. Where is your mind? If you don't know where it is, you're not cultivating anything. If you, not that you intellectually know. I mean, we may get epiphanies or states where we realize it, but we can't put it in words. But when we go and cultivate, we're actually doing something okay. So even if you don't know, like, can't readily say, I know where it is. <laughs> That's okay. Because truthfully, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> Find out what that means. There is no real direction, so I'm not going to lead you off 
in a different weird different you know directions here there is no real direction and we got to find out what that means so cultivate non-discrimination okay things become strong and then get old that's what these talks about in here towards the end of this uh chapter so they become strong and get old so they go through their waxing and waning periods this relativity okay when we're attached to it when we're sticking to this it's contrary to actually that which neither comes nor goes that which doesn't die and is not said to be living because there's no death so if you're not dying then there is no actual living you need the two to tell each other which one is what when you cancel one out the other one is canceled out automatically is that something so that which you know is not in line or let's just put it this way if we have our attachments to our, our relative states if we have attachments to a self an ego uh, personality time we will keep dying in the idea of that we keep dying and keep coming back and keep dying keep coming back this is what happens it's relative so he's talking here on relativity again in our cultivation or in our daily life. Fun stuff. Yeah, I know, I know I've heard different esoteric <clears throat> interpretations of things like the ruler and, you know, the, the soldiers and such being. Could be thoughts or it could be senses and the ruler could yeah. be the, the mind, you know. But I don't want to go into that. I wanted to, but I said, no, that just doesn't seem to fit. I mean, why does it seem to fit? Only because it's still more false thinking. Mm. If, if, if it was straight up before, we would have a lot more enlightened people, a lot more different type of stable cultivation. We wouldn't have more of the same people who are coming around or more, more people who are – I'm trying to rephrase this because I want to say it in a different way – more people are coming around to cultivation, but they're asking the same exact questions people did 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah, but isn't, isn't that part of the, the process that everybody's going to go through? If they're getting the same information, they're going to be asking the same questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my father used to tell me when I was a child, um, Something of this phrase kind of goes like this. Let's see if I remember this correctly. Uh, you always get what you always got if you always do what you always did. So if everyone's studying the same types of things, we're going to be asking the same types of questions. So when I hear questions of some students, or uh, I don't remember asking a lot of these questions because I didn't read anything. I didn't go to school or classes in my young age, eight years old, to before I started martial arts in 99. But that's nothing. I mean, it's just martial arts. It's nothing to do with actual cultivation uh, unless you make it that way uh, or unless your teacher actually did that. Like my Tai Chi teacher, Sifu Rudy Curry Jr., he actually uh, is a cultivator. Freaking awesome man too. If anyone has a chance to study with him, please let me know. Send me an email. I'll go get you in, t in contact with him if you're in mm -hmm. New York. He's, he's got a YouTube channel with some really, really good videos, too. Yeah, I, I don't remember his YouTube channel. I, I really don't get YouTube out here in China, but um, I could, but I just don't have the time to really look around. So, um, You send me an email, it's G-U-I-Z-H-E-N, uh, H-U-I at Y-E-A-H dot net. And if anyone's interested in studying with Sifu Rudy, I send it out to you. But um, in general, I didn't have these... Uh, books i didn't look for these books i didn't want to get the same information people got I, I just felt adverse to it so i used that adversity and i just went inwards to cultivate whether or not i got something that was in line i didn't know until i was about 25 you know 24 years old i met my Taoist teacher 25 i met my um buddhist teacher one of them I mean, I had teachers since I was eight years old uh, come and go through meditation here and there. Uh, when I got a little older, then I was – it was certified. What I had, the teachings I was 
utilizing were okay. It wasn't like I was studying some evil, you know, offside sect or something like that. Got me to a point where I can get to another set of teachings. So, yay. But anyway, the, f the fact is, if we're always reading the same things, we're going to be getting the same questions. That's why I throw out a totally different type of commentary here. I don't go into this cultivation, that cultivation. It's too much, too much leaves and no root, too much flowers and no seed. You know? Cool. All right. You want to call it a wrap then? We is wrapping it up. All right. So I guess uh, I'll just thank everybody for, uh, for listening and I'll thank you for joining us again. Oh, yeah. And uh, next week, our topic is going to be family and cultivation. So that Ooh, should be that's good. good for some people. That should be uh, good. good. Good for everybody, I guess. I shouldn't say some people. Yep. And to quote the final chapter of the Tao Te Ching, the sage does not accumulate. The more he assists others, the more he possesses. The more he gives to others, the more he gains. So thanks again, Lynn. Hey, thank you. I should memorize that by now. You say it every time. I yeah. say it. <laughs> okay, have fun. All right, take care. Bye.